Thanks, um, thanks Ahmed, and thank you to everyone who's still here, the hardcore group hanging on until nightfall, which will be in about half an hour, I imagine. Um, but so I, first of all, I want to start by saying I'm actually representing uh, one of my teammates back in Geneva who's busy working on this very um, review methodology that I'm going to present this afternoon. Um, so, so Theodora Collar, who obviously sends her regrets that she can't be with us, but, uh, but this work is central to the work of the Gender Equity and Rights team in Geneva. And I do think to some extent it sort of goes to your question, Paul, about you know, the, the, the monitoring is one part, but actually when, you know, what is the action that you take? Who does the review with that information? And this review methodology very much is designed to, to sort of address that. Um, so let me start. I'm going to make the presentation uh, in three parts. I have it up here. So firstly, explain a little bit the rationale for the uh, review methodology. Secondly, we did plan to do an interactive exercise, but given we're such a small group and time is, is really limited, I will just walk us through that. And then thirdly, give, give a little bit more detail about what this review methodology is. Uh, in terms of the rationale, um, as if the point hasn't been made clearly enough, it's essentially this. It's really recognising uh, that there are huge inequalities in health. I use the word inequalities uh, because I'm a human rights person and so there's still a divide there, I think. But there are huge inequalities in health um, across different groups in, within the same populations, within the same countries. So the data here is from Suriname and it's showing... Uh, HIV prevalence by ethnicity and sex across different ethnic groups in Suriname. And just to labour the point, here we have cardiovascular disease. And this really flags that it's not only important to look at one of these stratifiers, as Ahmad has just explained to us, but that we have to really look at the intersectionality of sex against income, against age, against rural urban location, because these factors interact with each other and create different levels of vulnerability within different populations. So the rationale, sorry, let me go back. So the rationale, I think, is clearly no better captured in, than in the SDG agenda about leaving no one behind. Um, uh, in terms of the, the interactive exercise that I wanted to go through, this, was some, this is really goes to the heart of what it is that we do um, in, uh, in the review methodology, um, which is basically about the lived experience. It's about drawing on people's experiences to allow them to step back and look at the way that they design health programmes and to challenge their own assumptions about how those health programmes have been designed. So what we did with this, um, what we wanted to do with this exercise was to imagine each of you sitting here is uh, a pregnant woman in country X, for example. Um, just put on my... So country X is a lower middle income country. Antenatal care visits are provided free of charge to all pregnant women who are citizens of the country. The provider network, unfortunately, is a little bit weak in some parts of the country. The distribution of health workers is a little bit imbalanced and weak in some areas, and there are concerns about the quality of health care provided. Quantitative evidence available shows that there are inequities by rural and urban location, as well as by income, education level, and ethnicity. So in order to understand some, and to do this analysis of why there are these inequities, what we go through with the, the, the countries that we're working on with the review methodology <coughs> is we take them through a coverage model um, looking at what we call the AAAQ, availability, accessibility, acceptability and quality of those health services. So when you're looking at availability, um, some of the things that you need to think about, so if you're thinking about this, this, this woman's situation, so she's living in a remote rural area where the primary health care healthcare services are weak. The healthcare centre happens to be far away, and sometimes staff are absent. So some of you may have seen the photographs outside that show uh, Indigenous women in Panama who have to walk five, four hours to get to the local uh, to the local health centre. So there are no outreach services for you in this in this context, and there's very limited access to points for medicines. So in this in this context, services are not available to you. The second consideration is accessibility of these health services. So you happen to live in an informal settlement or an urban slum area, and while there are services nearby, you barely make enough money to meet basic survival needs, rent, food, etc. You can't afford the informal payments that we've heard so much about this morning by the health worker for the antenatal care or for the costs of food supplements, the latter of which is not covered under the National Initiative for Antenatal Care. The third consideration that we, 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 we look at is acceptability of the services. 
And if it so happens that you are one of the country's many ethnic minority groups, you frequently face discrimination from the majority population as well as from the health service providers. In the past, you've felt discriminated by them, and you fear this will happen again, so you try and avoid contact with their services unless you really have a, a very serious problem. You may not speak the majority language, and you have trouble in understanding the instructions given to you. Services are, are supposed to be gen uh, culturally acceptable and gender-sensitive, and confidential, but you're not confident that you can go to these services. So again, the services are really out of reach to you. The final consideration is, is really looking more at the quality of those services. Um, so you happen to be, you're mostly illiterate, so the printed information that you're given is, is not understood. You've had one antenatal care visit in your second trimester, but it was very short. You were given 20 pills and an information card, and the provider did not take the time to explain to you what you needed to do and to make sure that you had clearly understood. When you tried the supplement, it made you nauseous, so you stopped taking the pills. Given the challenges you face trying to get to the health sector, to the health service, uh, away from your job, you, um, you can no longer afford to go back to the services, and you did not go back. You did not get the recommended antenatal care, clearly, and then, so therefore, your health has been negatively affected as a result. So this rather depressing picture is the kind of analysis that we would take using the um, data that we have available. Um, this is probably some of you are familiar with this. This is the effective coverage framework that was the basis for uh, the review methodology that we have developed in countries. But it draws very much on a human rights understanding of what AAAQ is. So AAAQ, it's this Tanahashi framework that looks at these are the different gradients. So these are the different uh, levels of coverage and the different um, uh, sort of ways we're, accept we're, we're analysing it that I just went through. And as you can see, as you go through each of these, you'll see that people are gradually falling further and further off with the result that nobody here would have been able to access those services. So going back to the review methodology, um, being lost between my different computers here. Um, the review methodology has been something that's been developed over the last two or three years, and Veronica can certainly, I'm, I'm sure, speak to a little bit more to this at the end of the presentation. The aim of the review methodology is to enhance capacity of uh, member states and, and, and you know, the ministries of health through enhancing capacity through applied learning. The idea is to use professionals' ongoing programmatic work to strengthen their capacity, but again, as I mentioned, to, to challenge their own assumptions, to be able to take a step back and look differently. The, the, uh, Veronica Birger this morning talked about human rights not being a separate ingredient that you add to a, a new recipe, but it's an entirely different recipe, and this is what, we're, what, what the uh, review methodology is about. It's also about identifying the entry points for action, um, I think we heard earlier is human rights is very much about establishing a, cir a circle of accountability. And so the review methodology really looks at the program and the policy design and tries to figure out at which point you can bring in gender equity and human rights more, uh, both more easily and also more, more systematically and, and, and robustly. So we conduct a guided analysis using a multidisciplinary review team to identify these different entry points to bring in equity, gender, social determinants and human rights. We also then look at um, the program's ongoing planning, monitoring, review and evaluation cycles. So this is not your typical fly-in, fly-out, international consultants type process. And I'll explain a little bit more the actual process design now. So there are three phases of the review methodology. And uh, I have to say I'm quite pleased Alicia uh, Yamin is no longer here because I know she has a, a particular phobia of checklists. But the first step is to conduct a diagnostic, is to use a diagnostic checklist to, to really get to the heart of what are the gaps in your, in your current programme. As part of that, we have this sensitisation phase, which is sitting down with the, members, uh, the ministries of health and related partners. So civil society very much have to be at the table in the these, in these sensitisation phase and throughout. Um, so we conduct a sensitization where we try and explain some of the concepts, the theory of, the theory of change, the theory of the program that they currently have. And then we, can, we conduct a desk review of all the different information that we have, including the health inequality data if it's available, including human rights mechanisms, reports, recommendations that try to get to the heart of who is being left behind by, a current, by that particular health program. Um, the five steps, so this five step review phase is, is a week long um, process that builds on this uh, information that's been collected and reviewed. 
and where the, the, the partners to the process will go through and try and identify different points throughout their programme where they can improve gender equity and rights. They're looking to identify the barriers in the programme and what are the facilitating factors. Um, they're also looking to identify what are the causes, um, what are the mechanisms generating the inequities, and the role of social participation and intersectoral action. The review methodology um, has, has been conducted in a number of countries. We're sort of piloting it, and we very much see it as a living document. Again, the mantra that there is no one-size-fits-all, something the UN says a lot, but really that we do take very seriously. Um, sorry. Uh, most recently, we're, we're, we've been working in Indonesia and Nepal um, on maternal and neonatal health and adolescent sexual and reproductive health programs. So again, the review methodology, we, working with the ministries of health, we identify the particular program to be reviewed uh, in agreement with all the partners. Uh, in Indonesia, they focused on reducing disparities among and within pro provinces, and also on how to expand universal coverage to 90% with basic interventions. In Nepal, working with the adolescent health, they were looking on how to leave no one behind in the adolescent health and development strategy. Getting to the interesting stuff in terms of, well, sorry, I was going to get straight into results, but yes, um, the more of uh, the sort of data that Ahmad was showing us earlier, these are again the disparities and the kind of data that we would use as part of this process. So the red dots on the left-hand side show the poorest quintile, the orange dots show the, the wealthiest quintile, and the, obviously the longer the line, the greater the inequities between those different groups. So for you, this is for Indonesia's... Um, uh, um, so, sorry, Indonesia's uh, maternal and reproductive health uh, data showing that there's huge inequalities between skilled birth attendants, antenatal care and DTP3 and slightly less but still considerable inequalities in breastfeeding, family planning and ORT. So Indonesia, as I mentioned, they're looking at their maternal and reproductive health program they, they identify four different parts of the program that they wanted to, to review, which were pre-pregnancy care, pregnancy care, childbirth, emergency obstetric and neonatal care, and postnatal and newborn care. So they looked at these different areas and across the findings um, tried to understand what needed to be adjusted um, and what was, how, how they were clustering the different changes that need, needed to take place. And again, this is not a... Uh, something that's, that's rigid or fixed in time, but something that has to be ongoing. So even though the actual review phase is part of a... There's, a, there's the pre-phase where they're looking at the data available, there's the actual five-step review where they sit down with all the, the stakeholders in the country to go through the programme, but then there's six to eight months of actually making adjustments to the programme based on the review that they've conducted. In terms of some of the outputs we've had from Indonesia so far... I won't go into the detail, but so for, you can see up here some of the examples of adjustments that they propose to make as a result of the review methodology. And uh, I just, perhaps I should say, I was recently in Morocco where we're also piloting this tool, um, focusing on the diabetes program there. And it's very interesting to actually watch the mindset, mindset shift occurring among the ministries of health, because on day one they stay, you know, really stuck in a very kind of medical um, mindset. But then over time, they're sort of they're a bit, you know, we're encouraging them to step back and look differently at the way that they design the programme and identify some of these weaknesses. So it's very interesting to, to watch this process un unfold. Um, again, I won't go into the details in Nepal. This is the timeline. I, as I say, we, it's sort of a six to eight month timeline for the adjustments to be made, but it really is over the duration of the programme because there's a constant monitoring and evaluation process that needs to be uh, built into the, into the review methodology. Um, so, yeah, again, this is, this is, oops, in, this is, sorry, going back to, again, to Nepal, so the Nepal review identified that some of the most, uh, the, the, the populations that really most missing out were the rural, hard-to-reach adolescents and urbanised adolescents from rural areas who ended up living in slums in the cities, and this is some of the, um, the findings from that that process that were, that were um, identified and that are now being addressed uh, as we go forward. I will stop there because I know, I'm sure there may be questions and I know that we don't have much time, but, uh, and Veronica, I'm certainly sure you can also speak a little bit more to this. Thank you. Sorry, 
No, no. Open the floor to any questions. You spoke quite a bit about the AAAQ. Um, do you want to say something a little bit about the the social participation, the social participation and intersectoral action, um, and then finally on uh, accountability? Yes, that's the one thing I did forget to say. Actually, we do use the AAAQ framework to look at coverage. But underlying all of that, of course, as you say, is are the human rights principles of accountability and participation. And this is very much built into the review methodology, that from the outset, the, uh, these are participatory processes. So we work with primarily our interlocutor as WHO, which is the Ministries of Health, but we also have other partners sitting down at the table. That's not to say it's, without, it's not without its challenges. I know in some of the countries we have been working the ministries have actually pushed back on having civil society there because they feel they would not be able to critique their programs with civil society in the room. So it's a difficult and a careful negotiation process to ensure it's as participatory as it, as it can be, but it's something that we obviously push routinely and, and try to ensure as much as possible. Um, for the accountability, as I mentioned, as part of the desk review, we look very much at all the available evidence there is about populations being left behind. And as I mentioned, that includes looking at concluding observations, recommendations of human rights bodies um, that flag some of the populations that may not be getting services or some of the more, more extreme violations that may be going on in the country. Does that answer your question? Did you want to say something else? Just, it was a leading question, wasn't it? So please go ahead. Well, I mean, I can say a little bit about... Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I can say a little bit about the participation, which is very important, involving civil society organizations. And um, we had recommendations on what those civil society organizations might be in some of, some of the countries, and um, there was pushback. Um, and then they did finally identify civil society organizations, and it was very interesting because um, it, it, the, the, um, the civil society organizations in, the, in Nepal really were able to step up. They were um, maybe not the ones that you would have identified that really are leading this work, but they were really able to... Um, really claim their own agency and have conversations with government. So we were really excited about um, that. I think this is a journey and a process, and we were we were excited about what we were, what we were able to see. And about accountability, um, what we are looking at is institutionalized accountability mechanisms that already exist. And so instead of setting up parallel ones, <coughs> because in some ways this group, this this the, these. Um, UN agencies, civil society organizations that are working with government um, along this process formed kind of a, a group that are accompanying the, the government. Um, but we think it's important that they fit in a larger structure, institutionalized me mechanism that already exists. So the accountability piece is something we're, we're also working on. Thanks again. It's really exciting to hear about uh, hear about this work. I was reflecting on something we've heard throughout the day, and you mentioned it as well. This fact that you, a rights-based approach to health is fundamentally different from just supplying health services. It's not a spice that we add to the recipe. Could, at the same time, it seems that the countries that have you know, invited you or who have um, applied the reorientation methodology are really positive although it may, might mean some painful changes in the way they do things. Could you say a little bit about how do you generate, or where does that demand for this work come from, and how do the governments react, how, and how do they plan to take it forward? Yeah, I mean, again, Veronica may wish to say more, but, but we have received actually overwhelming demand and interest from countries, which to me does flag the point that there is appetite to understand this better. I think equity and the, the, de the equity monitoring has also helped facilitate that because it's really made the information more available so that, you know, we, we do have the same goals, we have the same, you know, desire, sort of end results in mind. It's how we get there that may be slightly different. 
So we have been invited by, by a number of member states. Um, they are struggling with what we what is a rights-based approach and how do they do that? And I think the review methodology helps by, and actually I will say, bringing together the aspects of gender equity and human rights into one harmonious kind of tool that allows them to really work through. It also breaks down particular health programs. And so when they are doing the review methodology, uh, the five-step process during, during this week-long training, they have to focus in very, very tangibly and very practically to different aspects of their health programs. So I can give the example in when I was in Morocco, looking at the diabetes program in one region, you know, it became very clear that it was the, uh, they were called the ramedistan. These are the people who really are the most marginalized in the country. And it threw up all sorts of policy challenges that they were facing that were not about the health sector so much, but about much broader um, other, other sectoral issues. So yes, there is, there is actual great demand, but it, I think there is a, a gap in terms of the tools being out there and translating them, I think, as we heard this morning. So for that, I think the review methodology has, been, um, has, has really received quite some interest. Sorry, I should, if I can just add as a brief promo, unconscious Paul is sitting over here. We also do clearly, are, we are monitoring the impact of the review methodology. It is an ongoing process. We're piloting it and, and adjusting it as we go along. But we are monitoring, we're writing up case studies, we're doing qualitative and quantitative reviews of how the review methodology is contributing to change. And I put up some of those findings, which I'm sorry, I didn't go into more detail. But um, so we are trying to ensure that we are monitoring what difference this review methodology makes in countries. There was another question here. I'm a bit wary of you because you've retired and you have nothing to lose now, so <laughs> I'm a bit scared. So Be gentle. <laughs> I couldn't resist the confession. Um, in the 1990s, I was actually at the Global Commission on Women's Health and WHO, uh, established by the D then Director General. And uh, we selected three themes. One was maternal health, which was a group that I, those, I'm sorry for those who know me, I prefer the term pregnancy related because of the mother uh, rhetoric, which I think kind of pollutes the whole discussion on pregnancy. Um, and occupational health was another area. So I was just wondering, because you spoke about the process, but how do you select the topics? You, you, you mentioned diabetes in Morocco, because I think the selection of topics might be, there must be fierce um, competition over, over the topics chosen. And uh, I guess it's, it's quite sensitive how to, how to pick the topic. And some topics will be fought against and some. So could you say something about the process of picking a topic? I mean, I should say that to date, most of the countries we worked in have picked pregnancy-related health. Um, probably Thank you. because Thank you. the... <laughs> <laughs> Quick learner, quick learner. <laughs> um, no, precisely because there is more data available and there is also, I think, more mobilisation around this and there's a greater awareness that this is a rights issue. So I think there's a, a sort of um, a lot more being done in that regard. Morocco is the first, first country where we are working in a non pregnancy related uh, area mm -hmm. but it is essentially negotiated with the ministries themselves who will who will mm -hmm. choose the area and the and the issue that they want to okay. focus on could you say something about that dialogue going on between the, no i i, I can't no. Her, no. my colleague ted or been here she was very much part of those conversations when the delegations come to the WHO and we, we discussed them i don't know veronica if you're able to talk about that the dialogue between the WHO and the government in, in choosing the topic I think it's quite important when you learn, this is also learning methodology, but also kind of highlighting an issue. And I guess there'll be a lot of competition between the different groups. And you talk about the civil society, they will have very different interests in pushing their issues. Uh, well, really, we leave it up to them. Um, and so they look at their data, they look at some of the priorities, where they're seeing some of the, the blocks and, and the barriers. What we're seeing is that it's starting in one program, and so then the lessons that are learned in one program, that, that there is an interest or, um, to, to start working in other, other programs. So in Nepal, we did it on adolescent um, health care, and so now there's an interest to do, to do it in, 
in the other programs, and they actually want to take it up as a, a multi-country um, platform in all of Ciro, and uh, they would like to do it on adolescent. And we're quite happy about that because we feel that that could be a starting point and then other programs can pick up. I'm not sure how it was decided in, in Morocco. We were quite happy that there was one country that wanted to, to look into, into NCDs. Um, they're very interested in looking at the district level and not keeping it centralized. So they're taking, all of them are taking them it in a bit of a different uh, direction. I mean, if I may just add to that, it's also very much about the timing. Um, so this process is not designed to come in in the middle of a national programs course. Mm -hmm. So it's really meant to be finding the entry points in that um, particular program. And so in Morocco, it was they were developing a new national strategy on diabetes. So it seemed like a great opportunity to do it then. Uh, sorry, not a national strategy, a new regional strategy on diabetes. And actually now they're going to use the methodology for the national NCD strategy. So... Um, so yeah, it's, but, but again, it's about, I think it's very much about the timing also to ensure it's in the most sustainable way possible. And then we're, we're a tiny group in headquarters and with focal points in the regions and country offices. We see ourselves as facilitators getting this working and going and then the programs take ownership and move it along in, in, in deeper ways and with time and other programs, as I said, so. Should I wrap it up? Is that what you yeah. that one meant? Right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you.